Hello, friends, and welcome to online worship at Broomfield UMC. Wherever you're watching, we're so excited to have you worshiping with us. I invite you to connect with each other in the comments of Facebook or YouTube. And make sure you sign up for our weekly newsletter. We are the people of Broomfield United Methodist Church. We are called to celebrate the image of Jesus in everyone and love all people as Jesus loves us, with no strings attached. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. O oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. You dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. You will do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things, you have done great things, oh God, you do great things. In our series on questions, we have been exploring the questions that you have raised about God, the Bible, and now Jesus. One of the most important questions is this, what does Jesus saves mean? Is there any way to lose your salvation? These are great questions. I believe Jesus does save, and really his, main, his name means saving. Yet there are many facets to the saving work of Jesus, and today I want to introduce you to five of them. First, let me start with a story. Back when I was serving in Casper, Wyoming, almost 20 years ago, I woke up one morning after an unusual dream. I knew I was to look up a Bible verse, Matthew 1, 20 and 21. And uh, this is part of the Christmas story, as you may remember. But this is the first time I had ever been moved to look up a verse after a dream. So I looked it up in the NIV Bible. And here's what it says. But after Joseph had considered this, 
An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Well, I was intrigued about this name that uh, Joseph was instructed to give to his son, this name Jesus. So I looked up the NIV footnote after uh, Jesus there in the text, and here's what the footnote says. It says, Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Later, I would come to understand it would be more accurate to say that Jesus is the Greek form of Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. As Don has talked about in previous sermons, Yahweh is one of the names for God. And so the name of Jesus literally means Yahweh saves, or God in action, God saving us. So saving is not only what Jesus does, saving is who he is. It follows then that looking at the life of Jesus shows us how Jesus saves us. If saving is his nature, then saving is what he did. And we can see in his earthly life, his earthly ministry, how he saves us. Before we do so, consider the meaning of the Greek word soteria, which is translated salvation in our Bibles. This Greek word has several shades of meaning, healing, deliverance, preservation, and empowerment. In its broadest sense, soteria means to be made whole. It is Luke who records how Jesus explains his mission after Jesus delivers Zacchaeus from his miserable, greedy life as a Roman tax collector. You may remember that Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see Jesus. And Jesus stopped at that tree and said, Zacchaeus, today I must eat dinner in your home. That experience transformed Zacchaeus. And he made the decision to change his life and to start living the right way. And this is what Jesus said afterwards. He said, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. And I think we all, at different times in our lives, get a little lost. We get off the path of life, we get distracted, we lose our way, and Jesus seeks us out. He desires to help us and to bring us back on the path. Luke, the physician, uses a medical term, sozo. In this passage, he says, when he says, the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost, the word there for save is sozo in the Greek, and it means to heal or to deliver. And that is what Jesus does for us. With this background in mind, we can explore the different facets of how Jesus saves us. As we read the Gospels, we get a broad picture of the saving activity of Jesus, and yet it all begins with healing as Luke documents so beautifully in his gospel. Yes, the first aspect of salvation is healing, physical, emotional, and spiritual healing. We see the healing work of Jesus throughout the gospels. Most everywhere he went, Jesus healed people. Healing was as natural for him as breathing is for us. One of the most touching healing stories is found in Luke 8, 43 through 48. Let me read it to you. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his clothes. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling before him. 
She declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This woman's illness had not only debilitated her, it had also isolated her. It kept her out of community. She uh, really was isolated because she was considered unclean, so she couldn't go to the synagogue. She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't worship with other people. And so when she touched the fringe of Jesus' cloak, she experienced healing on all levels, truly. She was healed physically, relieved of this terrible condition. She was also healed emotionally because her burden was lifted and she was restored to community, social and spiritual community. I'm well aware that not all people who follow Jesus are healed. Not all people experience physical healing on this earth. And I don't know why that is. Personally, I did experience physical healing when I received Jesus as my Savior and Lord back when I was in eighth grade. I had been told by a specialist that my hearing was deteriorating and that I would need surgery because of a congenital hearing condition. But after my experience of being touched by Christ, my hearing stabilized and it got no worse from that point on. And my hearing is as good today as it was when I was 14. And I'm very grateful for that healing experience. One thing I am convinced of, and this is that all of us can experience emotional and spiritual healing through the touch of Christ. We can experience deep joy and deep peace. We can be relieved of our spiritual burdens. We can forgive other people so that we no longer carry that weight with us. Jesus heals us. That is part of his saving work. This brings me to the second dimension of the saving ministry of Jesus, and that is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Jesus forgives us. When he walked this earth, Jesus forgave people as freely as he healed them. That was a big part of his work. However, his ministry of offering forgiveness was not received as warmly as his healing ministry, as we see in many of the gospel stories. One example is the story of the paralyzed man that Jesus healed after his friends removed part of the roof of the house in which Jesus was healing people, and uh, the friends lowered down their uh, paralyzed friend into the presence of Jesus, and he healed them. And I'll tell you this story. It's in Luke chapter 5, 20 through 25. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, Who is this who is speaking blasphemies? Only God can forgive. When Jesus perceived their questionings, he answered them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you, or to say stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the one who was paralyzed, I say to you, stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. Immediately he stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went to his home, glorifying God. Jesus offers us God's forgiveness. God has the authority to forgive. God has conferred that authority upon his Son. And yes, Jesus offers forgiveness to all who ask. This is the nature of his bountiful grace, as Jesus demonstrated on the cross. He offered his life for us so that we can be free from the burden of guilt. Once and for all, Jesus saves by forgiving. As the old saying goes, to err is human, to forgive divine. Third, Jesus introduces us to God the Father, restoring our broken relationship with God. Jesus explains this aspect of his saving work 
At the end of Matthew 11, listen to what he says in Matthew 11, 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. What Jesus means by this is he reveals the Father, the Son reveals the Father. In our dysfunction and sin, our view of God has been obscured. We could not find God on our own. We were grasping in the dark. And so God's Son came to us to reveal God to us, to show us the nature of the Father. Jesus paves the way to knowing God, reconnecting that relationship. Indeed, Jesus provides the way to restore all our relationships, bringing reconciliation with God and also with family members, friends, associates, so that we no longer have to live in alienation. So far as it depends upon us, we can live at peace with our loved ones and our neighbors. We can be healed of estrangement. And most of all, Jesus allows us to be reconciled to God so that that most important relationship is restored. Fourth, Jesus teaches us how to live, and he empowers us to live in the right way. One of the most common activities Jesus engaged in while ministering on the earth was teaching. He functioned as a rabbi who taught us how to live. Jesus teaches us how to live rightly, how to overcome temptation, how to serve others, and how to uh, be loving in all of our relationships. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. He says, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The way Jesus teaches us to live is easier than the way of the world, with all its competition and anger, it is also more restful. We are freed from heavy burdens, as Jesus teaches us how to go about our business wisely. Moreover, Jesus empowers us to follow his teachings by sending us the Holy Spirit. The Spirit guides us, empowering us to live the way Jesus teaches us by transforming both what we want and what we do. As Paul explains in Philippians 2.13, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In the Wesleyan tradition, we call this empowering work of the Holy Spirit sanctification. With the power of Christ, we are able to experience freedom from habitual sin, the freedom to serve, the freedom to know our deepest selves, the freedom to uh, live our best selves. This is what God gives us. The story of Zacchaeus is a great example of the empowerment Jesus provides to live differently. Zacchaeus, as you may remember, had been defrauding people. He had been taking advantage of them in his role as a Roman tax collector. But after his encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus promises to pay back those he had defrauded he also promises to give away half of his goods to the poor. Zacchaeus was a changed man, ready to do the right thing, ready to start helping others. This is salvation. As Jesus said in Luke 19.10, after the change of heart that Zacchaeus experienced, he says, today salvation has come to this house. The saving of work of Jesus does change our hearts, it changes our minds. It changes our actions. A fifth aspect of the saving work of Jesus comes at the end of our earthly lives. Jesus escorts and welcomes us home. Salvation does not end here on earth. It begins here and it continues throughout eternity. We need Christ's help to get to our promised home in heaven. And he offers us this help. 
Left to our own devices, we might be drawn downward by the temptations and the trials and the negativity that we see on this planet. Left to our own devices, we might become unforgiving or bitter or vengeful. But I give thanks to God that we are not left to our own devices. When you receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you are inviting him to guide you through your life on earth and beyond, all the way home, all the way to heaven and to God's eternal kingdom. By transforming and sanctifying us on earth, Jesus prepares us for heaven. And when the time comes for us to pass, Jesus will take us home just as he did for one of the men who was crucified next to him. In Luke 23, 42, the man cried out, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus promised to escort this man home, and he makes the same promise to us. In John 14, 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Salvation begins here and now. The moment you receive Christ into your life, and really even before, and salvation never ends. Salvation empowers us to do some earthly good while we live here upon the earth. And the saving work of Jesus takes us home to God so we may live in God's presence eternally. As he brings us into the heavenly realm, Jesus will transform our bodies and our minds and our spirits to dwell in the highest dimension of reality. As Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. I'm not sure what our bodies will be like, but I know we will like those bodies that we have in the heavenly realms. Your eternal life begins the moment you receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, for eternal life is a different and better quality of life. It is also everlasting life. The salvation Jesus brings us knows no boundaries of time or space. It is a growth and wholeness that never ends. Salvation is God's free gift to us, offered without price or condition. It is offered to all for the asking, but God does not force us to receive the many wonderful gifts of salvation. God respects our free will. God does invite and woo us to receive these wonderful gifts. What we see in the ministry of Jesus is how much God loves us and wants to be with us. Quite simply, the risen Christ invites us to put our trust in him as Savior and Lord, to call upon him for all that we need all that he offers us. And then we can respond by living in gratitude and living in love in return. There is that lingering question, can salvation be lost after we receive Christ as our Savior? I believe it is possible to turn away and to renounce the gifts of salvation, but it is very difficult as we have seen, the gifts of salvation are life-changing. And these gifts include the Holy Spirit who guides and empowers us as long as we are willing. So I think the key is to stay willing, to stay open, to continue to follow the lead of the Spirit so that we keep that relationship with our Lord vital and fresh. I do know a few people who seem to have renounced their faith and turned their backs on Christ after receiving him, and I grieve about that, that they've done so. But it is never too late for them or anyone to turn back to Christ. There was always that opportunity to turn around 
to repent and to receive him. I cannot imagine life without Christ after experiencing 45 years with him. He has made my life so joyous and peaceful and purposeful. I am so grateful for his presence, and I love him with all my heart. Are you ready to receive the gifts of spiritual healing, forgiveness of sins, freedom from guilt, the power to make good decisions, freedom to serve others? And when the time comes, do you want the risen Christ to escort you home to heaven? If so, I invite you to claim this promise from Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Trust and believe that Christ is alive and speak it aloud that Jesus is your Lord, your leader, and receive all the wonderful gifts of salvation. This is Paul's invitation to you, and it is my invitation as well. Beginning a new life with Christ is as simple as praying a prayer to him, inviting him in. And the risen Christ welcomes all who wants, who want the gifts that he offers. And so I invite you today to call upon Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord. Please join me in prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for all the wonders of the saving grace you offer us, healing, forgiveness, relationship with God the Father, the power to serve, and eternal life. We are amazed at these gifts you offer us. We open our hearts to you to receive these gifts of salvation. You loved us first and we love you. You paid the price we could not pay. You give us what we cannot purchase. Help us to place our trust in you as Savior. We confess that you are Lord, you are risen from the dead, and you give us new life. We thank you for changing us by the power of your Spirit and opening the way to abundant life, for you are the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. You go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. Your love becomes my grace. me from the dry wilderness, and all I did was praise, and all I did was worship, and all I did was bow down.
picked up all my pieces you put me back together you are the defender of my heart when i thought i lost me you knew where i left me you reintroduced me to your love picked up all my pieces put me back together you are the defender of my Thank you for worshiping online with us. Before you click on to the next thing, I want to remind you of an upcoming event this Sunday here in the chapel. At 5 o'clock p.m., we'll be showing a film called Kiss the Ground. It talks about practical ways that we can be a part of the solution to the global crisis of climate change. There will be pizza afterward, and we invite you to come and be a part of the discussion. This week has been really amazing. As you can see from the set behind me, we've been hosting Vacation Bible School, and over 100 students of many different generations have been a part of God's love working in their lives. It's been amazing to see youth and children who have grown up in this church coming to VBS every summer, now leading groups, kids working together, having fun, dancing, singing, playing, and being assured of God's love for them no matter who they are. So as we go this week, go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve each other. Have a wonderful week.